Hi, welcome. I'm Pastor Darrell, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of New Glarus Bible Church in the beautiful city of New Glarus, Wisconsin. And I want to welcome you to our online service. Uh, we're glad that you're visiting with us today, and I'm hoping that you will be blessed. Uh, currently, we're uh, walking through the Gospel of Matthew. We're doing it chapter by chapter, section by section, and at times, verse by verse. Uh, here at New Glarus Bible Church, we have a passion for God's Word, and we believe that it truly transforms lives. If you're ever in the New Glarus area, we welcome you to join us for a Sunday morning worship service. And I promise that you will be warmly welcome. And once again, thanks for visiting us online. And I'm hoping that you'll be encouraged. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. Father, we thank you for those that have gathered here today. We pray for those that are still on their way. Um, Lord, I pray that um, you'll give them safety. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to gather this morning. We pray that um, you would hear our, our, um, our songs of praise. Uh, we pray that we would sing them from our heart. I pray that, Lord, that we would be attentive to your word as it's being preached today. And, Lord, that we'd be mindful of this opportunity to fellowship with those around us. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things, and give me life in your ways. <laughs> Such infinity, glory. 
with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need.
And uh, today, as we are walking through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we're going to talk about the heart of the matter and, you know, how to deal with broken relationships that are caused by anger. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you ever get angry with people? Uh, does anyone ever get angry with you? And I'm not going to ask uh, who you might be angry with or why you're angry with them. I don't want to start anything today, but... Um, <laughs> You know, learning how to control our anger is a very much needed skill. And learning how to deal with those who are angry with us is something that we need to learn as well. Uh, Aristotle wrote more than 2,000 years ago in his classic work, uh, The Art of Rhetoric. <clears throat> he said this, Anyone can become angry, that is easy, but to be angry with the right person and to the right degree, and at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not within everyone's power. That is not easy. Isn't that right? I mean, wouldn't it be great to know uh, who to get angry with, and to what degree to get angry with them, and at what time, and for what, what purpose, and, and in which way? It's, it's something that we all need to master, uh, not something that is always easy. Uh, you know, we live in an angry world, and, and we have even developed a, a vocabulary surrounding this topic. We have this new word that is uh, triggered. You know, I got triggered. You know, when somebody offends you, they said something that you didn't like or something that uh, they did something that you didn't, didn't like, and, and immediately that person is triggered. It's a new word. Uh, road rage has been around for quite a while. We... We, we live in the age of rage. People immediately get angry. Uh, we had a new word called canceled, and canceled is a way to get retribution uh, on someone who says or does something that you don't like. And canceled's an old word with a new significance. We used to talk about TV shows getting canceled. And today what people want to do is they want to cancel you. And in the process of them canceling you, what they want to do is deplatform you or take away any influence that you may have or uh, perhaps cause you to lose your job or your livelihood or your reputation. As a matter of fact, we actually live in a cancel culture today, and it's rather nasty. Uh, you know, we look around and there's a whole lot of what we would call character assassination going on and it's a way of ruining somebody's reputation so we need to understand just a few things I took some quotes uh, that I want to show you about anger uh, the first one my quotes are gone <laughs> okay uh, that's fine um, one one quote is this anger doesn't solve anything it builds nothing but it can destroy everything in a moment isn't that true it, it, it doesn't solve anything, it doesn't build anything, but it can destroy everything, and it can do it in a moment. Um, where there is anger, there's always pain underneath. Isn't that true? Hurt people turn around, and what they do is they hurt people. When you become angry and bitter about a situation, you usually turn around and you lash out at someone. Uh, this quote I liked, uh, Speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech that you will ever regret. Amen? Have you ever given a person a piece of your mind and then wished later that you had that piece of your mind back? You said, hey, I needed that piece of my mind. And uh, I regret the words that I have said. Uh, if you've done that, I'm guessing that it probably didn't turn out so well. So, you, so how should Christians respond to anger and how should we treat each other when we get angry with, with each other? Because the way that we respond is very, very important. And in this passage, we're going to see here today that Jesus tells us that our ultimate goal ought to be to reconcile with our brother. 
Uh, last week we looked at uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. And then we go down to verse 20 where Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about last, last week how when we look at the Old Testament, you know, we have given the Old Testament law and what Jesus did, and we're going to see this for the next four or five weeks, what Jesus did is he doesn't abolish the law, rather what he does is he elevates it. And what he does is he gets to the heart of the matter. He's not talking about rules and regulations. He's talking about our hearts. And we're going to see that today and for the next couple of weeks. So let me read our passage for today and then I want to pray. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 through 26. You have heard it was said that to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let's pray. Father God, as we look at this passage today, I pray that you would uh, enable me to communicate not only what it says, but um, the difficulty that there is at times in reconciling with our brothers. Lord, I pray that as we walk through this today, we will learn what to do and, and learn that we'll be able to navigate when we're angry and when there's murder in our hearts. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So today I have uh, five questions for us uh, to consider you know, when we talk about these topics of anger and murder. And uh, the first question is this. You know, what does the Old Testament say about murder? Uh, Jesus says here that you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And um, when we look at the Old Testament, what we find is that in Exodus, um, verse, chapter 20, verse 13, it says very, very simply, one of the Ten Commandments, it's actually the um, Sixth Commandment, the First Commandment talks, the first four commandments talk about our relationship with God. The Fifth Commandment talks about our relationship with our parents which is very interesting that that becomes before this one. But that one comes before this one because it's in the context of our home that we learn how to deal with relationships. But the sixth commandment says simply this, you shall not murder. That's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, um, you mean all I have to do to be right with God is just not murder anybody? Daryl, how are you doing in your relationship with Jesus? I'm doing great. Haven't murdered anybody this week. And so what we see in the Old Testament is that um, God has given us a command. The command is put there in place because he loves us. And he's putting boundaries around this area. And, and, uh, but what we see what Jesus does is he gets to the heart of the matter. And what he does is he talks about anger in your heart. You know, if getting into heaven only required this one thing, probably most of us would make it. Isn't that right? You haven't killed anybody this week, have you? All right. But in Numbers chapter 35, verse 30, it says this. Anyone who kills a person is to be put to death as a murderer only on the testimony of witnesses. But no one is to be put to death on the testimony 
of only one witness. So when we look at the Old Testament, there's this thing called capital punishment, and that if you took the, the life of another person, uh, the capital punishment in the Old Testament states that you should have your life taken. Uh, murder was a capital offense. It was a deterrent because when you're getting ready to murder somebody, you, you think about it, well, if I murder him, then I'm going to be killed. It was a good deterrent. It was a form of prevention. It was a form of punishment. It's reinforced in the New Testament in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, says that the, the governing officials do not bear the sword for nothing. In other words, they have been given the power to administer capital punishment. So let me give you three quick exemptions to taking the life of another. Uh, you can take the, knife, the life of another person in self-defense. You can take the life of another in the form of capital punishment. If somebody murders somebody, then the government can take his life. And then number three, when you are involved in a justifiable war. In other words, when you are defending your country, when you're defending the lives of innocent people. So there are some exemptions where it is okay to take the life of another. But the reason that we aren't supposed to kill other people is this. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we aren't supposed to murder because when we do that, we destroy that which is created in the image of God. When you go deer hunting this fall and you shoot your 30-point buck, we do not say that you murdered a deer we say that you shot a deer and that you killed the deer. There's a difference in the Old Testament between murder and killing. Uh, there's a difference um, if you, you go out musky fishing this summer and you get a 45-inch musky, you caught it and you killed it and now you're going to mount it. But you don't say, I went out and I murdered a musky today, okay? There's a difference. Well, what does Jesus say about murder? Well, in this passage... Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So let me, let me ask you a question. Where does anger start? It starts in your heart. That's where it starts. That's why Jesus says we're going to get to the heart of the matter. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it says this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Where does desire happen? It happens in your heart. Then desire, when it is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So before you murder somebody, there's something that transpires in your heart. You entertain that thought. Perhaps you, uh, you insult them, and then after that you elevate it and you call them a fool, and then the next step is murder. And what Jesus is attempting to do, <laughs> before you get to the point of murder, he says, let's look at your heart. Let's understand where this begins. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So in other words, when you're angry with your brother, it says here that we are to be quick to hear, we are to be slow to speak, and we are to be slow to anger. In other words, what we need to do is slow down that process. We need to be slow to Instagram. <laughs> we need to be slow to email. We need to be slow to post on Facebook. We need to be slow to tweet. In other words, we need not react to every situation. In Proverbs 15, it says this, that a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Isn't that right? 
You ever been around somebody who's really quick to anger? They have a real short fuse, and then you're always tiptoeing around them because you don't want to ruffle their feathers? Anger leads to murder. In Genesis chapter 4, uh, Cain became jealous of Abel because Abel gave a better offering to the Lord. And so Cain invites Abel out into the field. He picks up a rock and he kills him. Well, where did that begin? It began with Cain being jealous of Abel. And he entertained that thought in his heart. And that's what led him out to the field to kill him. So anger turns into insults and insults into name calling, which indicates that there's a contempt or in other words, a hatred in your heart. And so what what Jesus is saying, let's start with the heart. Let's not let the situation get elevated. And then in our passage, it says that you will be in danger of the fire of hell. What is Jesus talking about there? Well, right outside of Jerusalem, and everybody that he's speaking to would know this, there was the the Valley of Hinnon, Hinnon, and it was called Gehenna. And and, um, this valley is where people would take their garbage, they would throw it off a cliff, and it would roll down into the valley. Uh, Gehenna was a place where um, if if, uh, a person was killed because of their um, criminal offenses, what they would do is they would take that criminal and they would throw him off into the garbage dump, so to speak. It was a place where uh, sewage from the city would run into. It was a place where, um, actually back in the Old Testament, where people would take their children, their newborn children, and they would go to the Valley of Hinnon, and what they would do is they would sacrifice their child to the God of Moloch. And so when Jesus says that you're going to be in danger of the fire of hell, he's talking about a place that was literally hell on earth. But he was giving a picture of the actual hell. It was a place where there was maggots and there was worms and there were flies. It was a terrible place. And he's warning the people that if you commit these sins in your heart, you're going to be in danger of hell. So Jesus is using some pretty stern words here. And right now you guys are going, so I can't call somebody a fool. But didn't Jesus call people fools? And, and, and the answer to that is yes, he did. Well, then isn't Jesus a hypocrite? So let me try to explain that a little bit. What Jesus is talking about here is abusive speech. He is talking about literal hate speech. He's talking about speech that flows from a heart of contempt. He's talking about malicious malicious speech with the intent to harm a brother. He's talking about a personal attack. He's talking about attacking people with our words. And the word fool that he uses here comes from the the Greek word moros, the word from which we get moron. It's it's what happens in our hearts when we're really, really angry with somebody and we say, you idiot, you are so stupid. And so what he's talking about here is abusive speech. And what Jesus is saying is that we should not speak to our brothers like this because what it does is it reveals our heart of hatred. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, it says this, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So if there's anybody, a Christian, who has this in their heart continuously and doesn't deal with it, Jesus is saying, you know what, I don't even know if you're a Christian. Abusive speech is in the form of public insults. It, it, it basically, um, public insults are like character assassination. 
Have you noticed in the political world today, there's a lot of character assassination without accountability. Jesus is giving accountability. You can't assassinate people with your words, is what he is saying. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 17, this is what Jesus said. He said to the scribes and the Pharisees, he called them fools and blind guides. Well, why can Jesus do that? Well, because that was accurate speech. It was accurate speech. What he was doing is he was letting the people know, don't follow those guys. They are fools and blind guides. It's corrective speech. In Luke, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he corrects them. You know, they're having a hard time believing that, that Jesus is actually and physically arose from the dead. And, and Jesus says to him, he says, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's correct as speech. He says, you foolish ones. You know, why can't you believe the Old Testament and all that it has to say about me and the resurrection? So the apostle Paul follows suit when he, when he says to the Galatians in chapter 3, he says, oh, you foolish Galatians. You know, who has bewitched you? So calling people fools is not a bad thing if it's accurate speech or if it's corrective speech. In all reality, it's a virtue. If you go to Matthew chapters 23 and read that later today, you'll see that Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees 16 different names. Seven times he calls them hypocrites. So there are times when we should point out that people are acting foolishly or playing the part of a fool, and that's corrective speech. In Psalm 14, 1, and the psalmist says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. So the psalmist is telling people you are a fool if you can't believe that there is a God. Accurate speech. In Proverbs, 79 times the word fool or foolish is used, and the Proverbs tell us the traits of foolish people, and it calls some people out as being fools. So what's with that? You know, we can't eliminate the word fool because the Bible gives us the word fool to enable us to, to be able to designate what is foolish behavior or who are foolish people. Many, many years ago, um, when our kids were little, we did a, a study on the Proverbs. And, and we did a, a short section in there um, identifying fools. And we found as we walked through the Proverbs, there were many different um, designations of fools. There was a, the chattering fool, the person who won't stop talking. There was the lazy fool who was called a sluggard, the one who wouldn't get up. There was the uh, mocking fool, the one that mocked God. There was the financial fool, the one who didn't use his money wisely. And there was the wasteful fool. I was talking to Zach the other day on the phone. Zach's 20 years old. He's in the military. He's in England. And uh, he told me there was a guy that he was having a hard time working with. This guy was driving him crazy. I said, well, Zach, what's going on? He goes, he never stops talking. I said, Zach, remember when we did that study on Proverbs, the chattering fool? He goes, yeah. Every time I look at him, that's what I think. <laughs> but, but see, that enabled Zach to um, understand or designate that is foolish behavior. So we don't eliminate these Bible words uh, from our vocabulary, but we need to use them accurately and correctively, but never use them abusively. Jesus says, when you call your brother a fool, you are in danger of hell fire so what jesus does here is he is raising the bar in the old testament don't kill anybody in the new testament don't get angry and don't resort to abusive words so what's jesus's goal here what's his goal jesus's goal is reconciliation when you look at your passage it says here if your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother. 
And so what, what God wants, especially amongst the people of God, the people that we call the church today, God wants uh, us to have reconciled relationships. He wants us to have relationships that bring glory to God and that do not uh, bring offense to the church. And he, and he tells, tells us how to do this. Well, if, if um, we are angry with our brother, we need to try to make our relationship right. Or if our brother is angry with us, he's got offense against us, we need to, we need to move towards them rather than away from them. Uh, reconciliation is having broken relationships restored for the unity of the church and for the glory of God. It, it doesn't look good when Christian brothers are fighting. Amen. So Jesus says that we are to attempt to get those relationships right. And he says that we are to do it right away um, if your brother has something against you. This is what I have found. If you have two Christian brothers, sisters, and um, both of them are walking with the Lord, and one of them comes to the other one and, and tells them that, you know, um, you offended me when you did this or when you said that. I have found when you have two brothers that are walking with the Lord, um, the one will uh, admit it and say, you know, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that I had said that. I didn't know that was offensive to you. Will you please forgive me? And you know what happens? Then the other brother says, I forgive you. And then you move on and relationships are restored. In Ephesians chapter 4, let me just read this verse and we'll talk about it for a minute. It says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. You know, this is like the pathway to reconciliation. Right here, what, what we see when we look in here is we see gracious speech, speech that builds up, not, not, not speech that tears down. Uh, what, what is corruptive talk? Well, it's, it's rotten speech. It's smelly speech. It's things like profanity. It's things like vulgarity. It's, it's harmful accusations. It's, it's slander and it's gossip. So if we begin with gracious speech with one another, and then we have people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we have people who are willing to let bitterness and anger and wrath and malice um, pushing it away from each other. And then we have people who are kind to one, or one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, just as Christ forgave you. This whole process of reconciliation becomes easy, right? And right now, a lot of you are thinking, yeah, but. Yeah, but. And what about? <sighs> The question that we have is this. You know, what are our challenges in relationship to reconciliation? I went to a, a pastor's gathering this week. It was over in Oregon, and there were about 10 of us pastors that met. And uh, they had invited an author in um, to speak. And uh, he wrote this book. It's called Unpacking Forgiveness. His name is Chris Bronze. Uh, he gave us all a free book. And um, as Chris was giving his, his presentation, he, he started off with a long series of heartbreaking real-life illustrations uh, of people who had suffered tremendous betrayal, uh, wives who had husbands who had repeatedly broken their vows. And the question was, well, what should you, should you do? He, he told some, some stories of children, of parents of children who were killed in car accidents by, by drunken drivers. And, and the question is, well, what should they do? Should they forgive them? He told uh, stories of parents who had children who had been abused by, by people that they had trusted and, 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 and given their children over to, to, to care for them. 
And he told uh, stories of people who had been cheated and defrauded and violated and slandered and accused and abused by others physically, sexually, and emotionally. And then the violators had never repented or confessed or never really sought real reconciliation, but just merely went on their way. And the question was, what do we do? Do we forgive them? And I said on my hands because I wanted to raise my hands and ask about, well, what if? And what about? And then he said, you can't ask me any questions, he said, until you read the book. I thought that was unfair. <laughs> but I, 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 I know that we all have questions about, well, what, what, if, what if there isn't really a possibility of reconciliation? Uh, um, what if you, you have tried? And I think what Jesus is saying here is that Jesus is concerned with is this, is that an effort has been made and that resentment and bitterness isn't growing in our hearts. That we have made a true good faith effort to reconcile a relationship. But I think all of us know that there are some times where reconciliation, maybe it's not possible or maybe it's not time. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if possible, and so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The if there implies that sometimes it's not possible. Uh, as, so, as far as it depends on you, well, that, that puts the, the onus in your court. The ball's in your court. Some people are impossible to please, and it's not our responsibility to please them. It's, it's our responsibility uh, to please the Lord. And, and Lynn and I went to a conference about three years ago, and the speaker was a guy named Gary Thomas. And Gary Thomas was introducing his newest book, When to Walk Away, uh, Finding Freedom from Toxic People. And, and as I was listening to his presentation, I just kept nodding my head because it made such good sense to me. He, he pointed out that there are 41 times in the Gospels where Jesus just walked away or he allowed other people to walk away. Jesus did not run people down. Uh, in this book, what, what uh, Gary Thomas was saying is that um, if God wants us to have a full and abundant life and for us to have a fruitful ministry, that might mean that there are some people who are toxic to us and they may be, have to be left behind. And so then he gives us a definition of what toxic means. He, he said that all toxic people are difficult people, but not all difficult people are toxic. And so we need to understand that because there may be some difficult people in your life and you may want to walk away, but you shouldn't. OK, he says toxic people. What they do is they leave you bleeding in every interaction. Toxic people, they blame you. They accuse you. Uh, they destroy you bit by bit. It's death by 1000 cuts. Toxic people always let you know that uh, you never give enough or that you are never enough, and they always want more. Toxic people blame you, they demean you, they destroy you. They weaken you, they take away your joy, they keep you from fruitful ministry. They are argumentative, and, they are, and you will always lose the argument. They keep you from God's abundant life, and they constantly look down on you from their position of spiritual superiority. So if God has called you to a fruitful ministry, and he has called you to a joyful life, which he has, there are some times where you need to walk away. And reconciliation may not be possible. Jesus didn't try to be friends with everyone, and he did not change for anyone. Jesus didn't chase people down in order to get them to follow him. Jesus didn't lower the bar of discipleship in order to keep people from following him. He never compromised, and the people around him had to make decisions of whether or not they would follow him. And Jesus was constantly confronting the proud, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. He was not attempting to reconcile with them, and he never did unless they repented and started to follow him. 
So, you know, we, we can't and we shouldn't attempt to accommodate everyone and attempt to make everyone around us happy. It, it never works. And to do that would mean that we would need to compromise God's word or to compromise our convictions in order to accommodate their preferences. We should never do that. We should never become people pleasers. In Luke chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus said this, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how they treated the false prophets. Why did they speak well of the false prophets? Because the false prophets would say what they wanted them to say. He says, woe unto you. So there, there's another um, time when we can't accommodate people. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says, How can two people walk together without agreeing on a direction? You know, you need to be going in the same direction. And, and if there's no agreement concerning the most important issues in life, well, then how can you walk together? Theologically, there needs to be agreement as a church if you're going to walk together. Philosophically, there needs to be agreement. Go to Acts chapter 15, if you will. Acts chapter 15. Paul and Barnabas have been doing ministry together for about 12 years. They have had a very fruitful ministry. Wherever they've gone, they've seen results. Churches have been established. They're both very, very godly men. They're good men. They're friends. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 36, it says that after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Hey, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. It's actually um, a relative of Barnabas's. But Paul thought it best to not take um, with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them uh, on with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and he sailed away to Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and departed having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went throughout Syria and Sicilia and he strengthened the churches. So Paul and Barnabas here are having a philosophical argument. Paul says practically he failed us in the past. How can we count on him in the future? Barnabas said, you know, this gospel that we preach is all about second chances. And it says that they had a sharp disagreement. In other words, they had some serious words Paul and Silas were commended by the church they went off one way and Barnabas and John Mark they went off another way how can two walk together unless they be in agreement we find out as we go through the scriptures later we see that um, Paul is commending John Mark and he also commends Barnabas in another point. So in other words, there's not a, a lingering animosity there, but it's just a realization we need to go in two different directions. They agreed to disagree. Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus taught this to his disciples, and he also modeled it. He says, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet, when you leave that house or town. In other words, just. If they will not receive you or listen to your words. In other words, if you're involved in a relationship that is disrespectful towards you and abusive towards you, you can shake off the dust from your feet and you can leave. Chris Braun said in his book, Unpacking Forgiveness, a few things that were helpful. He, he says that, uh, number one, we need to accept that impasses happen. For example, Paul and Barnabas. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus and keep following. Don't quit on Jesus. Keep serving the church. Keep serving people. He says, say less, because without gossip, a quarrel dies down. He says, submit to the spiritual leaders that God has placed over you. And then he says, wait. 
He says that time heals wounds that emotions and reason cannot. Time heals wounds that emotion and reasons cannot. Well, what if, what if we want to give it one more try? What if we want to go and we want to attempt to reconcile? Here's just a few thoughts. Number one, keep short accounts so that you don't find yourself in this position. You know, check in with people that are, that are sometimes difficult for you and say, you know, uh, how are we doing? You know, if there's a situation, have I offended you? Um, did I do something wrong? You seem distant. Another thing to do is pray uh, to God for guidance and, and ask God to show you and um, you're part of the offense. Because oftentimes there's two times of the story, right? And sometimes it's us. And then ask God to open their eyes if they cannot see the way that they have contributed to the offense. Go into prayer mode. might take years, but pray that God would open their eyes. Pray that God would make them wise. And then, as it says in Matthew chapter 18, if you want to give it another shot at reconciliation, you go to them by yourself. And if that doesn't uh, get the result, then you go with another person. And then, as it says, that you go with the church. Matthew chapter 18. And if that doesn't work, then you walk away and you continue to pray, acknowledging that the best we can do is to agree to disagree. Let's pray. Father, we see in your word today that you desire for us to have reconciled uh, relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, And Lord, you even give us the steps and you tell us to do it with urgency. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that um, feels that this is what they need to do today, I pray you give them courage, boldness. Pray that you give them a plan. And Lord, I pray for those of us that perhaps have people in our lives that, you know, just for some reason, um, the best we can do is agree to disagree. Lord, I pray that we would not be discouraged, but that we would continue to serve you and that we would continue to follow you and that we would acknowledge that in life sometimes there are impasses. And Lord, I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.